In this lesson, we are going to review point slope, slope intercept, and standard form. The first two that you'll see on the top of your notes are point slope form and slope intercept form. So point slope form, that's the one you might have heard in um, intermediate algebra where they say you need a point and a slope. That's what you need to make that form work. So you'll see that the equation is y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. Slope intercept form is the one you have probably used the most and the one that you'll see uh, most common when you're graphing things. You've graphed out of slope intercept form quite a bit, and that's y equals mx plus b. What we're going to review here is, for these two forms, is not just what the form is, but we want to know what the variables represent. When you did this in Algebra 1 or Intermediate Algebra, you didn't necessarily know what the variables meant. You were just following the pattern and going along with whatever steps your teacher showed you to do. So in this lesson, we want to understand what does m mean, what is x1 and y1, and what are x and y, and kind of give them a definition. I do like to give essay questions on this type of stuff on a test, so it would be a good idea to write this down. The first variables we're going to look at is um, what m is, because I think that's the one that is most common that we know. If I ask you what m is, you would hopefully say that you know that m is the slope of a line. If we ask for ways to describe slope, a lot of times students will say you could give it as rise over run. Oops, let's write that properly, sorry. Rise over run. Or they'd say change in y over change in x. So I'm going to write it like this. This might be new to you, it might not. That's going to replace what you're used to seeing. Um, the formula you use probably is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And once you use that formula to find slope, a lot of you realize you could also do y1 minus y2, or y2 and x1 minus x2. And since these are interchangeable, they both work, we use this formula here. So that triangle is a symbol that represents change in. So we'll say it's the change in y over the change in x. And that means you can subtract either way that you're comfortable with given two ordered pairs. So that's what the m is, and you'd want to know what slope is. So giving me a definition for slope like rise over run or change in y over change in x is a good idea. The other parts, um, that, so that's common in both equations. They both have a slope. You'll see that there. Another commonality between the two equations is the x and the y. There's an x and a y here in slope intercept, and there's an x and a y in point slope. The x and the y, both of them, represent every ordered pair, or every x and every y. So they'd represent every x and y value. Because they represent every x and y value, they're going to stay variables. We aren't going to change them into numbers when we're writing the equation. We want them to stay variables so that no matter what ordered pair we're talking about, we could plug that ordered pair into the equation and then find the solution. So we will, when we're writing in point slope form or slope intercept form, we will keep them variables in our answer. Sometimes in our work we might substitute, but in our answer we will always leave those variables. So then what's different about point slope form and slope intercept form is in point slope form we actually have an x1 and a y1. Sometimes you'll hear that called x sub 1, y sub 1. That's just a specific ordered pair. So that's what we'll write down for that first. So x sub 1 or y sub 1 a specific ordered pair. And all they're doing there is being very specific with how they label it. We're talking about a certain ordered pair. Just like in class, if I was to call on, let's say we have two Kyles in our class. If I said, hey Kyle, what's the answer to this? You'd both look at me. Well, when I'm being specific, I might have a certain name. Like one, normally in grade school, let's say, they call you by your last initial also. So it would be Kyle S or Kyle B. That's how you'd know who they were talking to. In high school, we tend to give you more eye contact or maybe um, go by your last name or something, we'll call you. But that's a way to be more specific. So that's what X sub 1 and Y sub 1 are. They're a specific ordered pair. These are going to always be an actual number in our formula. So when we are plugging it into the form in our answer, you will see an actual number in those spots. So in the x sub 1 and y sub 1 in red there, you will see, when you see a formula in point slope form, you will see a number. So now that we've talked about the variables, what a point slope form equation would look like, an example of 1 would be y minus 6 
equals negative one-third times x plus four. That's an example of an equation in point-slope form. What I can tell you from looking at this equation, just by looking at it, I can tell you that the slope of this line is one, negative one-third. So I know that this line goes down. I can kind of picture it in my head, right? And then I also can tell you that one of the ordered pairs, so the specific ordered pair, is negative four, six. Now you might be wondering why I said negative four. In the formula, if you're looking at the formula, you will see that they have a minus sign right here. If that changes to a plus sign, the only way I could have changed that sign is if I substituted a negative number in its place, such as negative 4. If I would put a negative 4 in there, I would have said x minus a negative 4, which hopefully we see then as x plus 4. So that's where that came from. And then over here, the y minus 6, it's still negative, so I realized that that number I plugged in should have been just a 6. They, put, they substituted just a 6 in the y1 spot. So all of that information I can come just by looking at, I can figure out just by looking at point slope form equation. I can tell you the slope, I can name an ordered pair in that line, and I actually can graph from there. I can graph that line, but we'll get to that a different day. So that's point slope form. The other part is slope intercept form. They have a specific difference also. So in point slope form you will notice, or excuse me, slope intercept form you will notice that we have a b. The variable b is my y-intercept. If you don't remember what a y-intercept is, that's where your line crosses the y-axis. So for example, if this is a graph, my y-intercept would be the dot where my line crosses the y-axis. Let's say that's at 2. That's my b value. Now, you might be wondering why they call it b. I actually have, um, they have reasons I've looked up, and they don't really have a great reason for why they picked the letter b for that. I will say, though, that the letter M um, comes from the word montier, which is a French word that means to climb. So the variable M has a reason. The variable B, I haven't been able to find one, so if you can come up with one, I'll probably give you some extra credit for that, if you have a reason I haven't found. Um, but not really a good one. It doesn't represent any different language or something that would actually stand for a y-intercept in some way. So that is what we get from in slope-intercept form. That's what the B stands for. Now, those are those two forms that we're going to use quite frequently. The other one is standard form, and that's the next one in your notes. AX plus BY equals C. For something to be in standard form, you would first see an X, then a Y, then an equal sign, then a number. That's a lot of times how I would refer to it if you were taking intermediate algebra. Um, you will see this disclaimer right here, A, B, and C are real numbers. You might not know what that means, but for now, all the numbers that you've ever learned are real. You don't know any numbers that aren't real. We will learn some in this class, but you don't know those yet. So for now, A, B, and C can be any number you can think of. That's going to work for you. If you happen to know some numbers that are imaginary, then those, that's what they're talking about. They're saying that you can't have imaginary numbers in this form. Um, but if you haven't learned those yet, which most of you have not, uh, any number you can think of would be real. So for standard form, an example of an equation in standard form would be 2x plus 3y equals 7. So we're going to have, we're not going to worry about this number right now here, these numbers that are here, um, but we're looking at, it's going to be an x, a y, an equal sign, and a number. That's a good way to think of it. And they have to be in this order. So for example, if I had um, 2x equals negative 3y plus 7, for me to put it in standard form, I need to move the 3y to the other side. And then I'd be in standard form. So 2x plus 3y equals 7. That'd be my standard form. Standard form isn't so bad by itself, but it does have some rules that go along with it. Three specific rules that we're going to have to memorize. And so the first rule is that in order for something to be in standard form, the greatest common factor, which we'll refer to as the GCF, must be 1. Meaning, if I can divide the three numbers, so look at the coefficients and the constant in this problem right here. I've got a 2, I've got a 4, and I've got an 8. When I look at the numbers involved in the problem, if I can divide all three numbers by the sum number, they're all divisible by a number, then my greatest common factor isn't 1. 
So for this example, what number can I divide all three of these numbers by? Hopefully, we would say 2. So all of these numbers divide by 2. And since they all divide by 2, I have to do that to put it in standard form. So when I divide them all by 2, you'll see I have 1x plus 2y equals 4. Now I'm in standard form. Why do they do this is a good question. The reason they do this is because we want to be able to know that we're all talking about the same line. So let's think of this line graphed. Um, it's going to be, you know, let's just say it looks like this, okay? If I'm talking about the line and I call it this, like I'm reading answers in class and I say your answer is 2x plus 4y equals 8. Well, x plus 2y equals 4 is actually the same line. And so we don't want to have to say it a million different ways, because really you can make a line look very different depending on what you multiply it by. I could multiply this exact line by a third, and I'd get one-third x plus two-thirds y equals four-thirds. Now all three of these equations are the same exact line, but they look different when we talk about them. So we want to be able to have rules in place so that we all know we're talking about the same line which is why our first rule, having a greatest common factor of 1, is in place. So my only answer I would take for this is right here. That's the answer I'd want. The second rule is that your leading coefficient cannot be negative. Your leading coefficient means the first coefficient you see. Coefficient, if you forgot, is the number in front of the variable. So my coefficient for this problem is negative 3 and 4. My leading coefficient, so the first one you see, would be negative 3. So I can't have that first number you see, in the coefficient, be negative. For me to fix that so that it works and it's not negative, you could choose to either multiply everything by negative 1 or divide by negative 1. They both work. So when I distribute that negative 1 to all three spots, I then would get 3x minus 4y equals negative 7. Some people, instead of just multiplying or dividing by negative 1, they just flip every sign. That works, too, as long as you remember to do it to all the parts. So this equation right here is in standard form now, because I don't have a negative leading coefficient. And the last rule is that my coefficients must be integers. Integers are numbers that don't have fractions or decimals. And so I am not allowed to have any fractions or any decimals in my answer. You'll remember right here where I listed 1 3rd x plus 2 thirds y. This would not be okay. I would need to get rid of the fractions in this problem in order for this to be in standard form. So the example I'm giving you has our equation in decimals. In order for us to get rid of these decimals, I'm going to multiply this equation by a number to eliminate all the decimals. How I pick that number is I see what place value my decimals are in. All three of these numbers, my 0.5, my 1.5, and my 0.7, if I was to read them mathematically, I would call this number 5 tenths, because it's in the tenths place. All of my decimals are in the tenths place, so I would then multiply by 10. If I had numbers in the hundredths place, even one of them, I would multiply this equation by 100. So now when I distribute the 10 to all three spots, I end up with this answer down here. 5x plus 15y equals 7 not breaking any rules. I don't have any fractions or decimals in my answer, so I'm good. That's standard form. The one you might want to see is I'm going to give you um, 1 3rd x plus 1 4th y equals, we'll just say 2. In this problem, I have fractions, and so I'm going to have to get rid of these fractions. In order for me to do that, I need to multiply this equation by the common denominator of my fractions. Now, if my only denominator was 3, I could multiply by 3 and it would work. But I have a denominator of a 3, and I have a denominator of a 4. So I'm going to need to multiply by the common denominator between those two numbers, which hopefully you will see is 12. So when I multiply this entire equation by 12, I'm distributing the 12. You can choose to take 12 times 1 third on your calculator, if that's something you like to do, or 12 over 1 times 1 over 3, I would cross cancel. And then when I multiply across the top and across the bottom, I see that I get 4 over 1, which we would just write as 4x. Bring down my plus sign, distribute the 12 to the 1 fourth. 12 over 1 times 1 over 4, I cross.
cross cancel. I'm going to get 3y. And then I go ahead and take my 12 times 2 and get 24. So this would be my answer in standard form. Those are all three rules for standard form, which you're going to have to memorize, as well as the forms. We use them so often. I'm not big on memorizing things unless we use them daily in class. And these forms come up a lot throughout the year. So we're going to memorize for our first test and test after all three forms, point-slope form, slope-intercept form, and standard form.